Hello, I'm Sarah Smith, Editor-in-Chief of Prevention. And on behalf of Prevention, Healthy Women, and the Women's Alzheimer's Movement, I welcome you to part two of You and Your Brain, a three-part webinar series for everyone who cares about brain health. Last week, we looked at aging in the brain. Today, we're going to talk about how to navigate a dementia diagnosis. And next week, we'll dive into promising advances in medicine and technology. Prevention has a long history of bringing together science and wellness, and we've made a commitment to amplify the conversation around brain health, which is why we're so glad to be working with the Women's Alzheimer's Movement, a true leader in this arena, and healthy women with their deep commitment to improving women's lives. We're here together because women make up two thirds of Alzheimer's cases in the United States. And perhaps not surprisingly, women also take on the majority of the responsibility of caring for family members with the disease. And there are so many questions, unknowns and emotions when a dementia diagnosis becomes part of your life in any way. So I'm thrilled that we have gathered leaders in brain health and caregiving, as well as people living with a diagnosis who will share their insights with you today. But first, I'm honored to introduce our moderator for today's webinar, the incredible Joan London. Joan is an award-winning journalist, best-selling author, television host, and motivational speaker. For nearly two decades, she greeted viewers each morning on Good Morning America, making her the longest running female host ever on early morning television. As an ardent health and senior advocate, she has testified before the Food and Drug Administration, advocating mandatory mammogram reporting, and the Congressional House Ways and Means Committee, advocating for the Family Medical, um, Family and Medical Leave Act. Uh, she is a mother of seven, including two sets of teenage twins. And like many of us, she has juggled being a working mom while caring for an aging parent. She is the host of the Washington Post Caring for Tomorrow podcast series and host of the PBS television series, Second Opinion with Joan London. She has served as national spokesperson for various organizations and is the author of numerous books, including her wonderful latest, Why Did I Come Into This Room? A Candid Conversation About Aging. We are so fortunate that she could be here today because she is the perfect person to lead this important conversation. Thanks so much, Sarah. And of course, I made the title of my last book, Why Did I Come Into This Room? For, you know, exactly this reason. I think it's the thing that's scare that is the scariest as we begin to age. And it doesn't always necessarily mean that you're going to have a, a diagnosis of dementia or Alzheimer's, but it's still a scary one. And I dealt with this with my own mom uh, who was diagnosed with dementia. So um, hi, everybody. I'm really delighted to have all of our panelists with us today. Uh, I'll be here to moderate today's webinar, Navigating a Dementia Diagnosis. Uh, and I'm so glad that all of you, our viewers, have joined us for what I know will be an informative and engaging conversation on this very, very important topic. Uh, so let me introduce to you our panelists today. Dan Jaworski is a husband, a father, soon to be a grandpa. Yeah. Uh, pro professionally, he managed international equity portfolios for corporations and pension funds and endowments. He is also an avid basketball fan and has spent numerous years in coaching world, uh, the coaching world for both high school and special Olympics. Now, Dan was diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment, it's known as MCI, in 2019 at the age of 54. Um, but his goal is to become the first Alzheimer's survivor. Uh, and I should tell you that he's currently training for Ironman Kona and using that platform to raise Alzheimer's awareness by dedicating each of his 140.6 miles to those affected by the disease. Uh, we also have with us Julie Jaworski. Uh, she married her high school sweetheart, Dan, in 1987. She's been an educator and counselor at the elementary level since graduating from University of Minnesota in 1987. Now, Julie was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at the age of 26. And I should also tell you that she has run 26 full marathons and completed two full Ironman competitions. You guys, <laughs> when Dan was diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment, uh, Julie just knew that he too would defy the odds when dealing with a life altering course. Uh, and she says she's excited to see how she and Dan will continue living life to its fullest 
while having this kind of seize the day carpe diem mentality. We are also so happy to have with us Dr. Sarah Kremen. She is a behavioral neurologist and the director of the Neurobehavior Program at the Jonah Goldrich Center for Alzheimer's and Memory Disorders at Cedars Sinai Medical Center. And she sees patients with memory, language, and other cognitive disorders due to Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative diseases. Her research is focused on clinical trials and observational studies of people at risk of developing Alzheimer's and those already diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment and dementia due to Alzheimer's. Um, oh, and Dr. Kremen is actively engaged in educational efforts to improve evaluation and detection of dementia in the primary care setting, and also to raise community awareness about Alzheimer's and other dementias. Petra Niles is also with us. She is a gerontologist and senior manager of African-American services at Alzheimer's Los Angeles, where she um, has worked for more than a decade, Petra provides ongoing education and outreach in the LA area, as well as implementing culturally specific workshops to the African-American community in collaboration with faith-based institutions. And by bringing together community members and professionals from various agencies, Petra seeks to increase awareness of Alzheimer's disease and also improve service delivery. She also strongly believes in the importance of motivating young people to better understand and also to become active in this fight against Alzheimer's disease. We thank you all for being with us today. Um, I want to start with you, Julie, because I want to ask you, I mean, my mom had dementia, and I think back to when I started seeing things that were a little different. <clears throat> How did you know? What did you see that made you think something's go going on? You know, that's uh, such a great question. And it's something that everybody asks me that um, I I knew that something was bothering me because I had not only did I have to keep repeating myself, but I was also making sure he wasn't looking at his phone. He wasn't looking at the computer when I was telling telling him something. And this went on for a few months and I was starting to go crazy because it was things that he couldn't quite hold on to. And about six months after I started noticing that I was having to get his complete attention to tell him something, we went on our family trip and I told both of our kids, I just, I need you guys to tell me if I'm going crazy or are we repeating ourselves an awful lot? And after the trip was done, they both looked at me and said, please take him to see a doctor, please. So, so cognitively, he just wasn't, you had to like, kind of input it a couple of times and he had to be totally focused on you was so that people understand. Yeah. Completely focused on me. And, um, okay. but then even afterwards, like he still didn't do the, some of the things that I had asked him to do or, you know, whatever the, whatever the activity was because he told it wasn't there. He didn't have it in that memory. Were you cognizant Dan? that something was going on? And what was your no, not response? That, not at that point. So when we were on that trip, uh, you know, they noticed things that I didn't. And when, when we got back from the trip, what happened where I was really, what, you know, kind of my Houston, we have a problem moment was soon after we got back from that trip, we were traveling to a, a college that's two miles from our house that we've been to literally hundreds of times. And we're driving there and it's called Rollins College. And I looked at Julie and I said, uh, where are we going? And she said to Rollins, I said, I know that, but how do we get there? And so I, I had been to this place so many times. And at that point I knew, okay, something is, is seriously wrong. When you actually got the diagnosis, when you heard those words, what was your initial reaction, your initial response? Yeah, I, I was out running when this happened and my doctor called me and uh, I answered the phone because I'd been going down the, the whole testing route. And he said, I'm sorry to tell you this, you've got mild cognitive impairment consistent with Alzheimer's likely to lead to dementia. Um, and, and, and that put me on my knees at that point. I mean, at that point I was, you know, and, and, and he, had, he did add this too, he said, um, yeah, you know, we can't be 100% certain about an autopsy. And I told him, I don't, I don't need that kind of certainty at this. Well, thank you very much. 
Right. Um, but, you know, the, I, I just remember, you know, having that conversation, hanging up. I've got one knee on the ground. I'm just wiping away some tears. And, uh, you know, it's a very strange thing because I did two things in quick succession after that is one was call up Iron Man to try to get into Iron Man Kona. And the second was wow. to get a, a Carpe Diem tattoo. So, <laughs> yeah. All right. But so a couple of things. Is there... Um, is this in your family? Did you have any inkling? Did you expect it at all? Like you're a guy that's out running constantly, seemingly like a picture of health. I, I knew during the testing process, I mean, it, it you know, it's kind of like a basketball player. You have, you know, you have a number of shots and if you keep missing those shots, you know, you're not a good shooter after a while. And so, you know, we had like early on, one of the tests was they measured your hippocampus and it was 24% of normal in my case. And so there was, you know, and, and so all of all the tests kept coming back to like, God, I, I got to make one shot, don't I, in this? And <laughs> and unfortunately, the cumulative impact of that is that I, I mean, there's there's definitely something there. Uh, there. There was there was no question, I think, on on anybody's. Uh, but know. it was hearing those words like really meant it was for real. You know, I hear you say that your hippocampus was twenty four percent of the what it should have been. I mean, Dr. Kremen. Walk us through what's happening in the brain as this starts to happen and, and the diagnosis finally comes about for dementia. And how quickly do people change? Right. Well, and so, you know, the long going hypothesis more recently um, for the past you know, 10, 20 years has been this amyloid hypothesis. Um, and though we know that there is much more than just amyloid that's causing the problem, the belief is that for a long time, when people are normal and healthy, we develop um, a, a increasing amounts of amyloid in the brain. And this isn't good for the brain and causes inflammation and other um, bad effects on the brain, which leads to tau, which is another protein in your brain, which is actually inside of the neurons of your brain, which are helping your brain you know, form thoughts. Um, the tau misfolds and it hurts the neurons basically starts to lead to degeneration of the neurons and they start dying and when that happens that's when we start to notice that people are having difficulty and that's when they usually come in and say you know i i think there's something going on i think there's something wrong um how fast this happens you know, on average, we say that an Alzheimer's diagnosis is about 10 years, but you know, we know people who live with it for 20. So everybody takes an individual path through this disease. Well, you know, one thing that I'm thinking is that I, and even researching the brain for my latest book, I learned that if we um, exercise and pump that oxygen and the nutrients and everything up to our brain, that we can create neurogenesis and that those are the kinds of neurons that are the, the most likely to be able to connect to the central system, I'm saying in very lay terms. But here you have somebody who was doing that. Do you think that that staved off or that it helped? Or when you have this predisposition, is it just an inevitability? Oh, no, I believe definitely that exercise has a very important role. There is a lot of research around exercise looking at how when one exercises, it boosts up good chemicals in your brain. They're called cytokines and they are protective. And then there are other types of molecules that are not good and they're more inflammatory. And there is uh, a balance between them. And what they've shown uh, in dogs <laughs> and, and mice and certainly in humans is that you can tip that balance. And so I do believe that exercise is a very, very important part of um, reducing the uh, speed of neurodegeneration. And I do think that it definitely does help people in regards uh, to staving it off to some degree. And nothing is foolproof, but absolutely exercise is a big part. Well, Dan, and you've been running for all uh, yeah. your life is that yeah. A yeah. with you? I, yeah, I mean, I, I was played sports in, in high school and college till I blew out my knee. And then I've been doing triathlon for a while, so. Okay. It's one of the four stools for me, you know, the, the exercise. So one so of the four. You may, you may have delayed the onset. Would that be fair to say, Dr. Kremen? Yes. I mean, it, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, exercise can definitely help try to, you know, if it's going to happen, it will probably happen. But how fast it's going to happen and how dramatically 
definitely between exercise and also other factors that are very important over the course of our lives play a big role. Petra, I want to bring you in here to talk about <clears throat> the emotional response. And I'm sure there are many different emotional reactions to this kind of diagnosis, both on the part of the person diagnosed and also the family members. Can you talk to us a little bit about how these reactions vary and why that's normal? Thank you for that. Um, as Dan shared, this could be a time where many are just feeling overwhelmed. There can be sadness, grief, despair, disbelief, um, anger, there can be a combination of just being overwhelmed with what they have heard and not recognizing or understanding what the diagnosis means. Um, and some are actually in shock and after many weeks, then become aware of what the diagnosis is. So there are a variety of um, feelings and emotions that individuals have upon the diagnosis. And um, this is normal, the feelings of powerlessness and not sure what are the next steps and where do we go from here? So many are in this situation. You know, I, I, I hear like that he immediately took a knee, but then he immediately signed up for the for Iron Man, um, you know, and others probably go through that typical reaction. I think it starts with denial, then it goes through uh, anger, then it goes through kind of like the despair until you finally get around. Would that be a normal, not to say you're not normal, Dan, but I God, am bless you. God bless you. Uh, but Petra, would that be kind of a normal response that people should kind of expect and not beat themselves up because they're going through that? Absolutely. It's um, grieving a loss before it actually occurs. And these are the stages of grief, as you just mentioned, Joan. And yes, it's common. Um, what did it mean, Dan? What What, what is that diagnosis meant for like just your daily life? Right. It's, it's kind of like everything's changed and nothing's changed in many respects. Um, and so for me, I'm, I'm just really trying to fight it with the, the four levers that I have, which are diet, exercise, brain engagement, and sleep. And so I'm, I'm just trying to live out, you know, the best life I can and, uh, and try to be the first one to defeat this thing. And I know the odds are incredibly uh, against me. Vegas would never bet on me. But uh, I, I think uh, if nothing else, by doing all those things, you, you're going to Time is technology, you know, and advancements in yep. science and all of that. And so um, I've got a grandbaby coming. Life, you know, other than the disease, life's unbelievable. So uh, we're pretty good. Well, Dr. Kremen, let's talk about it. He just mentioned the four things. It's what you, it's uh, diet, exercise. Brain, enga uh, brain engagement and sleep. Brain At least and I'd sleep. love to hear more if there's another one. All right. right. So let's talk about those four things and how important they are, Dr. Kremen. So uh, they are very important and I feel like you can go and <laughs> you're giving a primer to all the patients that I see in the clinic. That is exactly what I tell everybody. Um, so we've talked about how important exercise is and shifting that real balance inside your body to um, reduce inflammation in the body. Um, in regards to sleep, I think that this is something that people um, don't pay enough attention to. Uh, we really do need sleep and not only that, um, as far as there are some research looking at the fact that when you're asleep, it's the only time that your body is not producing amyloid. So it's the time when your body can rest, when your brain can rest and consolidate memories, and also a time when the uh, amyloid is actually able to get cleared out of your brain. Um, yeah. So, you know, and all of us know when you're sleep deprived, you can't think as well. So there's many, many reasons to, to, to sleep. Um, in terms of exercise, there is no one foolproof diet. Um, and I, I will just be the first to say, I don't espouse any, any of the diets except for, you know, eating a well-rounded Mediterranean diet, um, where you <laughs> don't eat very much red meat and, um, lots of fruits and vegetables. And it's interesting that you talk about when you're asleep, 
it's almost like the little car wash is going on up there in your brain. When you're, that's this one chance, right? To, to, to wash all those amyloids out. And when you don't have sleep, I'm sure everyone has had that morning where you wake up and you just feel like your brain fog and it is kind of just exactly that brain fog, right? Yes, although I don't know that we are feeling foggy because we haven't cleared the amyloid out. I don't think that we know that much about it. But I do think, you know, obviously when we don't get a good enough sleep, our body doesn't have the reserve it needs. And of course we have, you know, it seems like we have slower thinking and, uh, and that obviously gets in the way of things we need to do during the day. How much sleep, doctor? Well, so they have looked at this and the research shows seven hours, no more, no less, <laughs> which is quite funny because I do think there are some people who just by their nature require more sleep. And then there are some people who by nature don't require nearly that much sleep. Uh, but the research shows seven hours. About seven hours. Yeah. And that's, and a lot of people are not getting that. And that also then plays into stress management when you haven't had enough sleep and stress management, that also I assume is very, very important in anyone, obviously in all of us, but particularly when we're dealing with um, MCI. Yes, stress in, in all the forms that it takes, you know, the mental stress can translate into not being able to concentrate, not being able to think well, because uh, it, your focus is taken away because you're, you're stressed. And of course, it's not good for our bodies either. And your body is attached to your brain. So it's really yeah. important to try to reduce the stress in whatever way with mindful meditation or just going outside and being in a pleasant space or thinking about something that makes you happy. Um, we know that stress does increase, again, these stress uh, cytokines, these pro-inflammatory cytokines. And um, that's not good for you over the long haul. So it's important to learn how to reduce stress, although it's, it takes practice when you have to work at it. Julie, what advice were you given about how to plan for you, your and Dan's futures, both medically and, and financially? Um, I was not given any advice. Um, I No, I wasn't given any advice. They, they did tell us um, right away to make sure that we had all of our financial affairs and all that in intact, which we had already done that. So we were one step ahead of that game. Um, I know that me personally, I believe in journaling and I believe in the power of positivity. And I, <laughs> I will, I am a counselor, so I believe in counseling and, um, together we've been going to counseling. I go my, by myself to counseling and, um, I, I think that that mental health and taking good care of myself is essential yeah. in order for us to take it, good care of each other. I, yeah. So absolutely, uh, Petra. I mean, it's enough to be dealing with, you know, this diagnosis, but you can take a layer of stress off if you have all those important papers and things in order. What are you? What do you tell families about the important documents that they need to have in order when you have a diagnosis like this? I tell families to make sure they consult with an elder law attorney in their community. And that way they can discuss advanced directives who will make decisions regarding medical, financial, uh, long-term planning and other needs depending on the family situation. And so it's really important to um, get a recommendation for um, an elder law attorney. And might we just say, Petra, that you don't need an Alzheimer's diagnosis to, we should all be doing this. Like every one of us should, uh, you never, you know, we don't lo know what's around the corner uh, to any one of us. I see Dr. Kremen shaking her head, yes. But I mean, every person, we should have this information on our spouse and we should provide this kind of information. I mean, this is the best gift. Anybody watching, this is the best gift you will ever give to your children and grandchildren is to have all of this information, all those important documents, you know, the HIPAA release, the, um, the advanced care directive, all of these things. Otherwise, you know, when someone's life is in the balance, you're gonna be the one that's gonna be making those incredibly difficult decisions. Um, we have a, a question from the audience. Let me ask you, the person says, um, and I'll give this to you, Petra. I live far away from my father who suffers from dementia. 
he does not want to move to my city and I can't move back to where he is. How can I make sure that he's getting the right help? Boy, this is tough in today's world, isn't it? When we all live, families are dispersed to such a degree. Yeah, this example is becoming more and more common. And one of the first things to do is to consider um, looking up an area agency on aging in the state where you reside and to um, investigate with whether or not they have geriatric care managers and speak with the care manager regarding a potential plan, discussing what's currently going on, what are the local resources where your father lives, and to be able to start creating a plan and actually executing that plan. However, it's necessary for the adult child to also monitor what's going on and visit periodically so yeah. that they know what's going on and can actually see things for themselves. I remember when my mom, who wouldn't move east where I live now, and she's a Cal California girl, and still has some friends out there. And when I would go out to visit her, the wonderful gentleman that uh, was in charge of the, the residence where she lived said, the most important thing to remember is never drop someone off. Keep coming back and visiting, even if you don't know that they even know who you are or understand what you're saying, because we don't really know how much they understand. So, you know, you, you were just discussing kind of the nuts and bolts of what we should do. Talk to us, Petra, about why this kind of caregiving can become so challenging. Um, you know, when somebody is caring for a, a loved one that has dementia or Alzheimer's and just they don't know what to say or what to do. Partly the role is very uh, challenging. Um, however, you come to this role, whether you are the spouse or the adult child, um, the first thing is to fully understand what you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And so having an education, some education regarding the disease, understanding that your role is a clinical one and, and requires certain duties that you may not be prepared for, but you can be educated about it from um, planning day-to-day -day activities, being the social worker, connecting with the physician and connecting with activities. Um, it's also a role where you may become isolated and all the things that you did as an individual, you may no longer be able to do that. And so isolation may occur, a loss of friends, um, the ability to um, remain in relationships, friends, and going out to activities. And also it's important to understand that you have to, in all the things that you're now um, doing, that you have to take care of yourself so that you are able to continue your journey in caring for your loved one. You know, I remember when I would go to visit my mom and um, another thing that the gentleman that, that ran the place said to me is that, Adult children would come in and they would say to their older loved one who was dealing with any kind of cognitive loss, they'd tell them, oh, Sally did this and Mike did this. And they, oh, well, what's going on in the life of their children? And the, and the older person would say, that's nice, honey. And then the younger person would get upset because why aren't you all excited about your grandchild? Well, they weren't, con he said to me, that older person mentally is not connected to that life and they they can't like it can't be meaningful to them he said take all the pictures of your from your mom's youth and and make books i would make up books of her childhood when she met my dad our early childhood of growing up and we could sit with those pictures and she could talk lucidly for an hour about each picture so, I mean, Dr. Kremen, they can, they can somehow reach down in and grab a hold of older memories. Am I correct in saying that? Yes, in Alzheimer's disease, what we know is that most people experience loss of short-term memory first, but, okay. and that's because the hippocampus oftentimes is the first area of the brain that's affected. And that's a very important area for laying down short-term memories. It's like a tape recorder for your brain. And when that's not functioning as well, you don't have good fidelity of newer memories. But the older memories are stored all over the brain in, a diff in different places. And so it is true that people may not have such a connection to what's going on currently because 
it's not getting recorded as well. But there are lots and lots of memories stored, uh, which absolutely are can be very clear. Sometimes clearer than the people who you know who are their caregivers, and they know things even better. And yes, absolutely, those things are still familiar. Those are things that are still really part of somebody's being. And one other thing I remember, he said, as much as you can when you're here, talk about your mom's past, because that's giving us the gift so that when we wake her up in the morning, we can say, good morning, Gladdy, you're here where you were married to your husband, Earl, where you raised your children. And he said, the more we have of that, you're giving us the ability to keep your mom comfortable, happy, and having a feel of, feeling of safety, because we're talking about things that she can actually relate to. And it's not something you just innately know when you start taking care of a loved one um, who is dealing with cognitive impairment. I mean, Julie and Dan, what's been the hardest or, or maybe even the most surprising thing for each of you in dealing with this diagnosis? You first. I think, well, I first of all, I think the hardest thing that we've dealt with in this is having to tell both sets of parents. Um, telling the kids was hard too, but they they knew every step along the way when we were going down the road of the testing. And so by the time that last test came through and he got the diagnosis, um, they, they kind of understood it, but we had kind of sheltered our parents from any of that. Yeah. And um, so when we did get that diagnosis, and had to share it with them. That that was by far um, the most difficult thing I think for us yeah, to do. Yeah, yeah. My mom is watching this. And um, <laughs> hi, mom. Uh, and and uh, uh, we lost my brother uh, several years ago. And I just it, it, uh, my mom was just. I just remember her so sad when we told her and just her telling me she just didn't want to outlive her kids. And so that's you know that hits right to the emotion of it. Uh, yeah, without a doubt, telling my mom was by far the hardest part. Yeah. What advice can you give us for that, Petra? One, of the, thi one of the things that um, sharing information about, um, you know, family members and um, is to understand that everyone has a different way of dealing with this situation and there needs to be time for family gatherings where you explain um, what's going on and how they can all come together for the person with the diagnosis. It's really helpful to do that. You know, I'll share with you, um, it's, it's hard when you when, when, when a loved one asks you the same question for the 18th time in an hour. And um, I remember I was advised that my, I, we had lost my brother to the terrible um, you know, circumstances of type two diabetes. Um, and so my mom would constantly ask, and that's really when with that trauma in life and she could no longer live with my brother and, and went into a residential facility, that's when it just seemed like her, her dementia just increased exponentially, which as I understand it can happen with big traumas. But she would constantly say, where's Jeff? When's Jeff coming? My brother. And I was finally taken aside one day and they said, don't keep telling her mom, Jeff died. Because you're making her relive that sadness all over again. There are times in life where a little white lie is actually the kind, compassionate thing to do. And so he would always say, "Oh, he's on a he's on a train. He's coming back from some from some from a friend's house. He'll be here like in a couple of days." And she'd say, "Oh, okay." And I kind of got trained to to stop reacting to that constant question. I see you shaking your head, Dr. Kremen. I got good advice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, because, you know, it's hard if you think about it. If your short term memory isn't working very well, then your reality, that's your reality. You don't realize, you know, that's your reality. It's not somebody else's reality. And you you aren't keeping track of those things. So it is like reliving it again and again. And that's very painful and stressful for that person. So it's better to not harp and focus on what's true or not true at that moment about these things, because it's a losing battle. I mean, you know, somebody's reality is their own reality. They haven't kept that information. So 
it will be a shock every time. <laughs> It's like Julie, you said you thought you were going crazy because like, is it me or what, what's happening here? Is that exactly that's what you were experiencing? I do have a question for, for you, Dr. Kremen. It's always difficult when you when a loved one is changing because of this diagnosis. What do we actually know about whether that person that we knew is actually still in there and how much do they realize? I mean, I've always wondered. I didn't I never really knew how much my mom really knew uh, and how much of the old mom was really still there. Right. Well, that's a very, very tricky question. I don't know how much they, a person knows. I have no idea. But I do know that even as people are not able to necessarily, you know, stay up with what's going on currently and they are forgetting things, there's a lot of of them that's really still there. One of the things about Alzheimer's disease is people really seem to retain a lot of their social graces and a lot of their personality and things that they loved before, they're still going to oftentimes still love and they'll sometimes still crack the same jokes or have the same reactions to things. And so you can see that somebody's in there. there there's definitely, and it's not the same thing for every person, but certainly, there are these charming moments that occur in my office all the time where you can tell that somebody's in there. You can tell that they're a person. You know, they may not be able to remember what happened yesterday, but they are themselves. There's no question of that. Julie, I, I, I'm sure that that's what you're, you had to be shaking your head. Yep, yep, yep. Yep, yeah. completely. <laughs> so yeah. what, are, what are your hopes for your future? Such a great question. I guess the biggest hope is that as as we go down every day, I mean, our, our word for the year is today. And um, so that we focus on getting the most out of every day. Um, I, I think one of my biggest hopes is that, especially my family with my two children and grandparents that, um, we understand better of where Dan might be coming from as, I mean, right now he is doing so phenomenal. He, he just really is. You would not know it other than some of the little things that I experience. Um, I just want everybody to know that this potentially might come down the road and that if we understand it better, that when I got the, when we got the diagnosis, I felt a, a sense of relief off because I was literally going crazy having to repeat so many things and thinking, am I just that boring to listen to? Is it, you know, like what is going on? So, but, and, and now when, when I do have to repeat something or he didn't remember to do something, or we just talked about it and then he asks the same question a couple of times, I at least take a deep breath and understand that this is what's happening to him. So just, I guess, having a better understanding of the potential road that we're going down. Dan, how about you? What is your, What are your hopes for your future? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's pretty simple. To philosophically, um, I, I want to continue to lead a grateful life. Just being, you know, I say, I say this every day. Thank you, God, for the gift of today. I am me today, and I am grateful. We're just uh, so lucky to even be here. I also want to continue to be impactful uh, and to, you know, serve other people, the Alzheimer's community, and uh, just have as many adventures with this beautiful lady I'm sitting next to <laughs> as long as I can do that. That's pretty simple game plan. And uh, I promised her a long time ago we were going to live to 100. This is well before we were. And so that that uh, that promise is still in effect, and I'm going to do I will uh, you know no stone unturned turned to get to that point. So I I love that promise and I love that goal. You know what would you say to the person out there who says, oh my gosh, like he's paying attention to his diet and he's doing all this exercise and making sure like why work so hard if there's no cure yet? Yeah, yeah. Cure I think yet. earlier t time is technology. Um, I, I do believe there's a ton of money going at all, you know, all these different diseases and people believe that diabetes, hypertension, a whole host of the other ones, they're somewhat linked with brain health, gut health. Yeah. And so maybe if you saw, and then uh, Dr. Kevin will probably know way better than me, but if you solve one, maybe you'll solve several. 
So, um, mm -hmm. and, and why not? I mean, I, I, you know, I tell people other than disease, I feel great. I'm, I'm eating the healthiest I've ever been. I work out all the time. I mean, almost um, to a fault. You know, it's like the rest of us just say, just have a cookie once. Like, I just do it. we will not do it. <laughs> right. That that cookie is not on the Mediterranean diet. He's not going to do it. Yeah, and it's just <laughs> I, I know that doesn't really matter, but mentally, I'm just stronger if I just yeah. don't the exceptions, and that's just it's you know. And it's usually easier for a lot of. I'm the same way. If I'm, I've got to stay on the straight and narrow. <laughs> Otherwise, I like go off, and then it's like, oh well. Um, but Dr. Kremen, what would you say to that person? Uh, out there that says, you know, why should I be working as hard as Dan if there's no, you know, cure? Uh, what would you say to them? And by the way, there's no cure yet because I think I just, correct me if I'm wrong, I just saw the FDA approve one of the first medications for Alzheimer's like t three days ago. I mean, we're at that precipice, I think. Right, right. So, um, and just to, to clarify, so that that drug it does not, has not been proven to change the clinical outcome of Alzheimer's disease. It does pull amyloid out of the brain. So that's just oh, so that we're, we're clear. But I um, to, so thank you for explaining that. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, so yes, I mean, I guess you can have a really fatalistic approach to it. But the thing is, is um, you should be exercising and, and eating well, it, you're going to have a better quality of life. Anyway, I mean, it's and the thing is, I, I really think that um, Dan and Julie have the right attitude. It's a hard thing to do, but it is really the right attitude because every day is a new day. And we know that exercise, yes, it's for your brain, but it's also for your heart. It's for everything. And it's also for, you know, your mental health. I mean, all of these things are just really important. And I guess I just believe that we should all be living in a healthy way because it makes your your ability to spend the time that you do have, you'll really be able to spend that time because you're healthy, you're able to go outside and spend time with your family in, an, in a way that you can because you're physically and, and able to do so, as opposed to um, you know, being sick because you're not able to take care of yourself in these ways. And doctor, all I know that life matters. as I was researching all of this, you know, as I was writing my last book, I, I remember research that said, it's really maybe most important to be doing this running and, and cardio exercise in your 20s and 30s, which is, this is not just information here for like people in their 60s, 70s or 80s. I mean, first of all, Dan was diagnosed at 52, but there are things we should be aware of and do in our 20s and 30s where it's really important. Am I correct in this, doctor? Yes, so there's been a lot of work done looking at our risk factors for de developing dementia over the course of our lifetime. And we know at various points along our life, there are certain things that are very important, which have nothing to do with your genes and nothing to do with your you know, family history, but have to do with things that we actually might have some control over, like preschool education. It's really important to get an education um, because it's, and also learning another language, you know, having that ability to have another language um, makes your brain more flexible and perhaps gives you some cognitive reserve for later on when your brain needs to be working at a higher level or perhaps is having some difficulty. Having had that practice, having had those pathways, uh, not burned, but it's a metaphorical burned into, into your brain really does help you know, the activity of your brain later on in life. We know in midlife, it's very, very important to manage diabetes. It's really important to exercise. Um, and when we're in later life, it's really important, for example, to uh, be able to hear and see. So, you know, putting off getting those hearing aids. No, you know, you shouldn't put it off because our brain needs sensory input. And we know that not being able to hear increases your risk for developing dementia. So these are all important things that we can do to help uh, prevent or try to reduce our risk of developing dementia. And it's interesting because we were, there was just legislation passed to allow the hearing aid industry to um, really make big changes because boomers, uh, they'll wear AirPods, but they don't want to wear hearing aids. So now I hear Bose and Apple are all getting into the business of making hearing aids at a lower cost that look like AirPods because it's kind of cool to wear AirPods. It doesn't make you look old. Um, but, but a lot of people, they don't realize the critical importance of being able to hear. Julie and Dan, I mean, first of all, what advice would you want to just impart today to those listening? 
Go ahead, you go first. Um, I think one piece of advice is don't be afraid to seek out the the it, it, the help or the guidance. Um, I, you know, I waited six months really before we went down the road, but I. I think that I think there's just like type one diabetes too. I mean, there's a lot of people walking around with it and they just keep pushing something under a rug. Oh, I just, I'm getting older. I'm getting forgetful. I'm, I'm this or whatever. And knowledge is power. So seek out the advice and go get it checked. Maybe it is just you getting older. That's, that's great, but maybe it's more than that. And, um, so that that would be my advice. Just knowledge is power. And when, when we know what we're dealing with, that's easier to go forward. And what would you say to somebody who who might think that someone that they love, that maybe there's something wrong? How do you how do you t tell them to what 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 advice would you give to that person? I would just tell them to get that, you know, the, the testing row to go to your primary doctor. first. They're yeah, going to do the simple MOCA test where you draw the clock and there's, you know, what year is it and who's the president right. and all that stuff. And that's got, a, I mean, I think that's got a pretty high uh, success rate of at least flagging if things are wrong. So I would start with that if you think there is. And the sooner you can get on the path, the better for this. You get them help, you get them meds if they need it. And then, you know, maybe you start altering their uh, diet, exercise, brain engagement and sleep things. So, but, you know, but I kind of think that, and then maybe I'm wrong, Joan, but I think the question was really, well, how do you help somebody who might not be real, that might be re resistant to that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm sure that's true. I'm, I mean, that's probably the norm, don't you think? Well, I will tell you that I, I held off and held off because I knew, I knew, I knew that there was something amiss. But I didn't even want to bring it up with him. It was just like, how do I say this? And yet the day that we had to get to Rollins College and he blew up at me in the car, which is not typical of him to do. And just just yelling at me, tell me how I get there. Yeah. That was the day that I knew we had to have a conversation. And that is, boy, then you better be very tactful and Peter would be able to help us out a lot more with how, how yeah. we go about asking, but I, he, we had to be tactful. And then of course we made the mistake of, I told him that, and then he got on the computer and did every oh. Google search on, yeah. on brain game. Like, and that, that was not right either. Like that, that, <laughs> that was not the way to do it. So yeah, the internet can make you crazy, right? Yeah, I don't nope. know that I have a good answer for you. Petra probably the, does. The but. Petra, Petra, I think you, I think that Julie's right, Petra. It's the people, the support people. And, and we have actually a question from the audience. What should I do about visiting a loved one with dementia? My aunt gets so upset when we leave that she actually gets destructive, but I just can't imagine not going to see her. So what should we do? One of the things that was mentioned earlier in the conversation is to um, go along with the conversation that the person is having mm -hmm. so that you're not uh, saying, well, that didn't happen or challenging them in any way. Simply going along with the conversation is helpful. Making sure that you're speaking to them face to face and not from behind them or on the side of them. You're also using shorter sentences and not saying a lot in one paragraph. Oh, really? um, okay, and that's something that we, that you, we should be aware of? Yes, how to communicate so that they understand you. So keep it short and sweet so that it's more understandable, not, not be all like wordy. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, absolutely. And for the aunt who gets upset when um, the family members are leaving, well, you identify the behavior and that's the first thing to uh, consider. So you understand that whenever someone is leaving, she gets upset and you can talk about that amongst the family and to also explore what that actually means. She misses you a lot. Is there an issue going on? Um, and each family situation is different. So just coming together to explore ideas and then adapting maybe the time that the family members are visiting is not a good time. And so just to reconsider some things. So you identify the behavior, you're going to explore ideas 
and options and then adapt as necessary. And from just listening to you, it makes me realize how important it is to get that proper support group and maybe a gerontologist or a doctor who specializes in this who can give you those little clues like don't do wordy sentences and you know like those are all like the little clues that make it much easier i do want to get another question answered and i think i'm going to give this to you dr Kremen. it's from the audience after i was diagnosed with early stage alzheimer's i found that once doctors see it in my medical chart they treat me differently I feel dismissed or that my questions and concerns are not taken seriously. What should I say to doctors that treat me this way? Are there buzzwords to let them know that I'm still an intelligent person? Yes, uh, I'm so sorry for that. Um, I see that a lot. And um, what I would say is look them in the eye and don't be afraid because they're a doctor. They're also a person and so are you. And I would just say, you know, doctor, I would like to, I want you to address me. I'm the patient and I care about me and I'd like you to talk to me about what's going on with me. I, really, and that's okay. I, I really do. I mean, you can do it in a polite way, but it's okay to say that. You know, there's a lot of, um, there's hierarchy in medicine and everybody's always afraid to, you know, to go against the doctor, but you're the patient. And if you can tell that that's happening, just politely say, you know, doctor, I'm concerned about me and I am happy that my family is here to be my second pair of ears, but uh, I want you to talk to me. I want, I want to be you know, have in this relationship and you know, it's my care. Support is so, I'm sure Julie and Dan, I mean, support and the people that you have around you. And I don't just mean family, but I mean the experts who can advise you yeah. medically and legally and all these things is, is, has got to be, incredibly important to how to live out your life with the diagnosis, right? Yeah, we've been very fortunate Absolutely. to have good doctors uh, on, on that all around. So the one thing I would like to add is just that the, the kind of the, the, the touchy part in all this is um, like for me, I, I can't really notice if the hourglass is losing sand, you know, so to speak, yeah. right? So um, I told her many times, I want her to be honest and not nice to me. I want to know if wow. you're seeing it. So that's, I think, another ramification in here. And I understand being kind to the person and all of that, but yet I want her to tell me, hey, if, did I, if I already said that, please tell me again. Um, so that's, that's kind of the, you know, the give and take of this whole thing. But that's hard, right, Julie? It is really hard. And I don't want to upset him. And I don't want, you know, and I, to be honest, there have been, I'm getting better, but there have been times where I've said to him, I've already told you that, but I may, maybe didn't say it in the nicest way. <laughs> like, oh my God, I've already said that to you. And then then he gets upset. And so yeah, like, yeah. I mean, then you're, oh, the tight rope, you yeah, know? It's, it's so, working through it. It's working through yeah. it together, so, yeah. Yeah, it's like walking that little fire path, you know? <laughs> It is, it is. You know, and, and we're talking about support, Petra, and how important it is. And I know that there are quite a few support groups um, for caregivers of people with Alzheimer's disease, but I think it is harder to find ones for safe, perhaps, I mean, you th I think about women who don't have partners because men tend to die before we do, um, who have the disease. Um, what advice would you give to find good support groups? believe based on the state where you are, you can look up the uh, Family Caregiver Alliance. That's a great starting point and finding out what um, support groups exist in your community. And also, if you should find an organization that offers support groups, but not one specifically for those with a diagnosis, then I think advocating for one is beneficial and maybe necessary because I believe that they will, based on the need, um, find a facilitator and be able to start a group because there is definitely a need for that. You know, Dr. Kremen, when I'm, I'm listening to all of you and what I'm really hearing is that while everybody in life should have a primary care physician, and not everyone does these days. Young people, the name of their primary care physician is Google, <laughs> which doesn't always give you the best advice. Um, but when you suspect 
that there is an issue. And by the way, if this runs in a family, should should that be something then? How important is, I, I don't know if I asked it, how important, um, you know, a health risk because of your family health history? How much does that play into this? Uh, so health history does play into some degree. If you have a first degree relative who's had Alzheimer's disease, then your risk is increased by what about one and a half times. There are, uh, there's a very small subset of people who have Alzheimer's disease where it's really autosomal dominant, meaning that it is very genetic. And if you even get one copy of this gene, you will develop it, but that's less than 1% of all people who get Alzheimer's disease. So it's not the common form. Um, so yes, I mean, there is some amount of genetics that plays a role, but there's a lot of, as we mentioned, there's so many other things in terms of risk factors that are not necessarily tied to genetics at all. So that what I hear you saying is just because a relative, even a mom or dad, that had dementia, that does not mean that we should expect to get it ourselves. That's part A of the question. And part B, that I should be doing everything I can do to eat properly and exercise and get sleep so that I can protect my cognitive thinking. Exactly, right. Just because you have a relative is not a guarantee that you yourself will develop Alzheimer's disease. And even if you have, you know, people have heard of a gene called APOE4, this confers increased risk, but again, does not guarantee that you're going to develop Alzheimer's disease. So it is really imperative that we take care of ourselves from the get go and do the things, you know, I feel like I tell patients, you came all the way to the doctor so that I could tell you what your mom told you, <laughs> but you should eat well and get sleep and you should exercise and you should engage in things that you like, you know, that bring you pleasure and that challenge you. <laughs> but it's true, <laughs> it's really true. What, a kind of a final question, what does my loved one with dementia, that would be you, Dan, need the most from me? the the wife the the mother or father that that person what do what do they need from us the most uh, julie you want to take that one i would just simply say this is just love just, just um, i think love and support and just i might be mad at you today but i'm here tomorrow i mean i just 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 love Love, love big, man. Love big. <laughs> Dan, did she hit the nail on the head? Yeah, I mean, she's been awesome. And I think it's the, you know, the, like, if I lose this battle, the hard battle is going to be for her, really. I mean, really, you know, we all know that. And so I'm just, I'm just so thankful that we've had all the time that we've had together and we make a great team and, and we just want to keep rolling. And you guys seem to be doing everything possible to ensure that you are going to, you know, hopefully defy the odds uh, and at least be able to have the time you have together be the best quality time, which I think is what Dr. Kremen was talking about earlier. Absolutely. Every day is a gift, right? And uh, treat it as such. Absolutely. And um, Petra, because you deal with all these families, what is that loved one with the dementia? What do they need the most from us? As Julie said, love, care, support, um, a sense of safety, compassion, empathy, and just being there for them, really, really important. And understanding that somewhere inside, they're still there. Um, it's an H1, even when there's um, old business in the relationship, that letting go and just being in the now is really, really critical. And and I and I think what we've also heard today is the importance of having the support around you, the support from the loving wife, Julie, the support of parents. And I imagine, you know, as hard as it for you, Julie, I have to imagine I just because we're we're parents, right? right? We can only just imagine how difficult it is for uh, to see this kind of a diagnosis in our children. You guys have all been absolutely great today. We thank you so, so much. Um, on behalf of Prevention, uh, Healthy Women, and the Women's Alzheimer's Movement, we thank you all for being with us on the webinar. And for everyone watching today, we really appreciate you joining us. We hope that you feel more informed. And we invite you to visit Your Brain 
2021.com. And there you can register for the final installment in the You and Your Brain webinar series, which will happen on June 22nd and will focus on the future of brain health. And finally, we hope that you might consider making a donation to support the Women's Alzheimer's Movement, which funds women-based Alzheimer's research and also educates people about brain health and Alzheimer's prevention. So thank you, everyone. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you.